Guys, let's lock it up, please. It's the kind of movie that I always enjoy watching. <laughs> It's though it's a, a, a kind of disaster movie. A disaster just averted the last minute. Let's roll south, please. It is a possible Armageddon situation. Action hero is something I never uh, really thought of myself being a part of before, uh, but it's a blast. It's totally fun. I think this film will hit with audiences because it's about ordinary people in an extraordinary situation. Action. Polar Opposites is a, is a movie about what would happen on, on the Earth if the magnetic poles of the planet were to shift, causing great land masses to rub against each other and move from one place to another, which causes all kinds of havoc and, of course, a tremendous amount of destruction. It's an exciting story, um, and uh, at the same time, there's the story about the, uh, my character, David, who um, is a geophysicist who some time ago wrote a book with uh, some predictions as to how the um, Earth might be heading towards uh, doomsday. This can't be good. This is an internal problem. It's not coming from the sun. Right. Solar wind hasn't changed. The Earth's rotation has. From these readings, it looks like we're slowing down. Uh, I play Martin Ward. He is, uh, he's a geophysicist, and he is deeply committed to what is true, uh, what is factual only. He's not, a, he's not much of a theorist, as opposed to David, his, uh, his partner. Uh, Martin is really um, devoted purely to what he can prove, and they have a falling out, and they're, so they're no longer working together. And then there, there's a problem with the planet, and some uh, the things that they have uh, argued about in the past start to actually come about, and they have to reunite and use their opposite perspectives on science to come together and solve the problem and save the planet. So it's a sort of building uh, disaster, and there's only a few people know what's going on, and trying to persuade everyone else as to what's really happening. Do you know how the dinosaurs died? Yes, they got a taste of your cooking. Uh, no, Dad, I'm being serious. There was, uh, there was some kind of massive geophysical event, right? Uh, uh, pro most probably a meteor strike, but something else happened. The Earth's magnetic fields were weakened by up to 80%. That's why the dinosaurs weren't able to re-evolve. There was a massive die-off of all living things. Well, now it's our turn. Charles Shaughnessy is a very natural actor. He's a very uh, professional guy, and he doesn't require a lot of, of babysitting. And we had a wonderful time with him. He was, uh, he was very friendly and uh, very into it. And, uh, and he's very believable. And the relationship between him and his father, played by a wonderful actor named Clive Revel, uh, was really good. It was really good, and you really believed him, and you really connected between them, and they felt like real people to me. I was half expecting to have to clean a fish before you gave me something to eat out here. I thought you liked this place. I said your mother would have liked it. Uh. I would have preferred you bought a house in Beverly Hills, taken me to see some celebrities and walk the red carpet. Come on, Dad, I'm not that kind of famous. Just wrote a book. A bestseller. The public loved it. Yeah, those at the science fiction conventions. My peers didn't seem to think much of it, if they even read it at all, that is. I think the film is about relationships with people and character. I mean, the outside, the big story is, I, would, I guess you would call it science fiction. But more importantly, it's about the relationships of these scientists and then their relationship to the military and to the government. How much time do we really have before the whole thing gives? Based on what? Radiation saturation? Intervals between quakes? I mean, I got nothing to compare this to, Marty. 
I wouldn't want to hazard a guess. Gut instinct. How long? You're saying you want me to use crystal ball science now? David, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't support you when the critics started tearing you down. I thought your theories were amazing. Yeah, but they were light on facts. You're right about that. Yeah, true, but... Only one fact should have mattered. You were my partner. It should have been enough for me. Even if I couldn't wrap my mind around all your ideas. When you analyze a picture like this and try to figure out how you're going to approach it, you have to look for the human drama. We're not able to actually destroy the entire world, but we can show the destruction of the world by focusing on a core group of people and how this sort of disaster affects them as people. I get a call from my agent, which if your agent calls at 7.30 on Friday night, you're pretty sure it's an offer for a job because <laughs> they don't call just to hang out, you know. And uh, he said, uh, listen, here network, four-star general. And I said, yes. <laughs> it was, I really, and he said, you can't say yes, you have to read it. And I said, Michael, they don't write roles for women like this. Of course I'm going to do it. I love that she's also heroic. She's not just a general standing in the corner you know, spouting boring lines. She actually is heroic and proactive and does something. And so um, it's very exciting for me to play this part. Dr. Barrett, I don't give a damn what was or wasn't said in the past. We need your help right now. I need to understand exactly what you think might be happening so I can advise the President of the United States how to fix it. I was very surprised uh, to find Beth Grant as a general. It was a last minute casting coup in my mind. She was wonderful in Jericho and Donnie Darko. She has a, a reputation for playing hard-nosed, hard-edged, tough characters. She couldn't have been sweeter. She was so nice. I was, just, I, was, I was just stunned and floored. And people would come in, and some of the scenes would be maybe five pages long, and they would do them just like that and never blow a line. And to me, that's you're cold, coated in gold at that point, and that's exactly how she was. It was just. Just, I know it sounds like I'm making all this up, but she really was wonderful. I loved being able to show her humanity and her emotion, and I was lucky and grateful that the director covered it closely so that, you know, hopefully it'll, you know, enrich her character, make it more complex, and show what women could do for the world. But he managed to tell us a nuclear strike has been ordered already. I know, we got maybe 30 minutes. 30 minutes. All right, we have to formulate a plan. The White House War Room has an old telex machine. It isn't in use anymore, but it would be monitored in the event that satellite and conventional communication channels are down. If I could get to a telegraph station, one with a shielded hard line, I may be able to get a message straight through to the president. Yeah, Some place that, uh, that wires money transfers. Perfect. Oh, there's, a, there's a place in the corner mart by Jenna's clinic. That's it, let's go. Lead the way. My character is an oncologist. I was really excited to be able to play her because I've had cancer myself. So it was nice to be able to, um, to play a doctor. Although, at some point on the set, I think I said, you know, everybody be glad I'm not your doctor because uh, I really had no idea what to do with the, um, the various paraphernalia I was being handed. Here, hold this, here, hold this. And suddenly, you know, you've got uh, lights and scopes and things that I had not researched properly. Tracy comes from like a, a sitcom sort of background to where you know, they're used to kind of coming in and hitting their mark and moving stuff. So extensive blocking wasn't really an issue for her. She was used to doing a four or five page scene with several moves and walk and walk. And she knew exactly how to lean and not lean to not block you and to make sure she stayed on camera. She really was a director's dream. Look, things are happening that may indicate an upcoming geophysical event. In English, please. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still working on the data. Well, to hell with the data, Marty. What's going on? I, I'm not sure yet. Do you think David may know something? Well, David has theories and ideas, Jenna. I have the facts right here in front of me. OK, Marty, clearly the two of you need to talk. You were lovers, Marty. You were best friends. You've got to stop punishing each other. No, we've gone our separate ways in completely opposite directions. OK, look, that's silly. This is important. Just let him help you with this. Hello? Jenna. Marty, if you can hear me, give, just give him another chance. Ken Barnett is a, an actor who I believe has only been in LA for a short while. He comes from uh, New York and he's a stage actor. And I believe this might have been one of his 
earlier roles or maybe one of his larger roles. Uh, I found him to be very natural. He's a guy who had to learn a lot about the filmmaking process, uh, baptism by fire, as they say, because we throw you out there and you're, you're on your own. I really like the relationship between Martin and David, and I feel like uh, when they have to reunite as a result of this catastrophe that is about to come uh, uh, on the planet, I, I like that they have to sort through their ideological differences um, with an urgency that is, you know, they have to come forward and, and do this thing for the good of mankind and survival. He came in and uh, he learned very quickly. And a lot of times there are things that you're doing that people say, I don't understand why I'm doing this or why I'm doing that. And I always say, just trust me, you'll thank me later, you know? And he did, and I thought he had a great look. I thought he had a great look and I thought he was a great compliment to, to Charles Shaughnessy's character. Your theory is based on a concept that assumes that there are, are definite nodal points in certain global magnetic hotspots. Completely unproven, and yet, magnetic anomalies have been recorded at nodes along the supposed planetary grid for centuries. Nodes? Areas of marked magnetic field fluctuation. <laughs> Go ahead. Go on, David. Tell her where these nodes are. Machu Picchu, uh, the Great Pyramids, Stonehenge, uh, the Bermuda Triangle. Oh, that's right. Turn away. Keep your calm. You know, you didn't move out here because the Earth was calling it quits. You quit. You resigned from life and just gave up on everything and everybody. Well, what's interesting is this particular scientist, who is someone who's a bit of a maverick and, and um, listens both to the facts as he sees them, but also to the universe, his instincts. And so it's playing that kind of character that's interesting, that's sort of really um, hiding away from the world and living up in the cabin with his dad, but forced to enter back into it because he, he may be able to help. So yeah, it's an interesting process, definitely. Multi-layered process, this one. This is a great group of people, and you can feel it, you know? Like you can walk onto certain sets and people are hostile and tense and everyone's in their corner on their cell phone, but it's been a really nice collaborative group. I think shooting disaster films are a little more difficult than a drama because you have all the elements of the drama, but you also have the extra added uh, problem of creating uh, an end of the world scenario. And how do you show that? And how do you make that happen? And how do you convey that to the actors a lot of times when they're dealing with things that they can't see? So you've got to kind of get into the drama element and you also have to sell them on the visual of what they're going to see in the finished product. What's going to happen is uh, he's going to come in and pick through the rubble and then we'll jump to the end of this where you and him and go out and then we'll go inside the set and do the part where you find Melanie dead and all that stuff. This is one of the friendliest sets I've ever been on. I love Fred. He is the sweetest director and yet he's very strong, very in control, notices every detail and thinks ahead, sees mistakes before they happen, which as you know is huge. How about that? Ah. All right, it's broken, all right. And then the reverse, Alberto. Oh, I hate you, lady. <laughs> hate is such a strong word. Well, I asked him the other day, I said, where did you train? And he said, School of Hard Knocks. And he said, because I've made every mistake that can be made. I was interested in this film because of the visual aspects of the physical destruction of the cities and things falling on people and the earth cracking open and cars exploding. And I like killing people and blowing things up in movies, so I went right for it. So what I'd like to do is when you first get her up, and you guys do that little bit, just make that move. Mm -hmm. Just make that move over there and I'll cover it from over at the other spot. Because mm -hmm. all that get up, walk across, I think it's gonna play. I like to stay a little looser in a scene like this because yeah, of all the damage. Stuff. People sure. paying to see a movie about damage. <laughs> and so I wanna see the damage. But when you get over here and you sit down, we'll come in okay. for that exchange. So Making a film that deals in what essentially is a giant series of never ending earthquakes has its own problems, uh, especially trying to do the physical uh, element of it because nowadays with CG, it's, it's easy to just drop back and punt and you can do it all later. I don't believe in that. I don't believe the actor is going to respond to that unless something really happens, something they can really see. So we invented a thing we called the dumper and it was really a giant plywood plank with some holes in it, some straps on your wrist so you wouldn't lose 
hold of it and drop it on someone. And we piled every kind of lightweight debris that we could. We had a giant truck full, and we would hold it above the frame. And when the camera would shake on the count of three, they would dump the stuff right on you. It was a, a massive amount of stuff mixed with the Fuller's Earth, which is kind of like a baby powder that's colored like concrete, which puts up this big cloud as everything starts falling. You know, I checked out all the foam core before, and it was all light and safe, you know, no things sticking out or nails or anything. Tracy Nelson had the, the unfortunate spot to be the first dumpy. And that's why we developed the plywood thing, because the first thing they used, it got away from them, and the pole did fall and hit her on the shoulder. It's in the shot. And the thing literally bounced off my head, this big pole. I thought, and all I could think was, God, I hope they got that on film because they usually never do. And I did feel bad dumping all that stuff on her all the time, but you know what? She never complained. The atmosphere on set seems to be um, just really supportive and very positive and fast. So it really counts to have someone at the top who knows what they're doing. I mean, it really pays off. I mean, he knows exactly what he wants. He's very willing to listen and work with the actors if there's something that needs to be figured out. Um, and that then just trickles down. It just means that everyone on the set is able to do their job because they're not looking over their shoulder for some kind of uh, um, explosion. So, so far, so good. I'll keep you posted. It's a very light set. Uh, Fred is totally accommodating and, um, you know, willing to try things. It moves fast. We're, we're going quickly. So it's almost like you kind of get settled in a moment and then they're like, moving on. <laughs> it's just a little crazy. Stop filming me. Do you see I'm a ball of stress? Against most people's advice, I actually like working with children and animals. I think animals add a certain amount of production value to a show. It's something that a lot of uh, programs don't want to get bothered with because there's a certain amount that goes with it. The SPCA and the handlers and getting them there and taking care of them but nothing says Middle East to me like a camel. And so I was determined I would have this camel and goats. Well, I said the goats could do double duty in the Mexico scenes. So we'll bring in some goats and we'll bring in the camel. And when you see this, I thought, you know, it'll sell you on the idea that you're really where you're supposed to be. Background action. When you do a big scene like the sandstorm opening in Iran, you have to rely on several different people to help you out when there's too far away to be yelling at people. I'll use a series of sort of sub-directors who will be midway point and then at the other end of the set, and they will actually block and coordinate what all those people will do so that every time they reset, they go back to the same spot when you call action, that each one of them does exactly the same thing. And I do it for the lens. If I move the camera halfway up the street, I'll re-block the action to kind of keep everything busy all the time. And so it's kind of, that's kind of the way something like that works. You, you have to get all your people going, and you have to get them all going at the same time. Fortunately, I think we had a great, great group of people. Action. And we give it to you. And one, two, three, hit! One of the techniques that we employed a lot was a foreground miniature, which is a technique that's been around since film was invented. It's nothing new. In fact, it's probably out of style in most people's uh, uh, arsenal of, uh, of tools to work with. I like it because you can look right at the monitor right now and see what the shot's going to look like. And when you get the dailies back, you can look right at it, and there it is. It's not something you do in post. It's done right on the set, and the actor can come over and say, OK, that's what the street looks like. That's what it's like. And now they know what to do. It kind of connects the people to the effects. Now, we're in a world today where beautiful miniature cars are made for collectors and otherwise. But then we went out and bought some SUVs, and I beat them up with a hammer. I crushed them with a hammer, and I had a toy uh, light pole that we laid across them. And then we would stick it in front of the camera, which makes it look bigger. And we just keep lining it up until the background in the car looks the same. And when you see the shot, they pull up with the telephone pole across the, uh, the SUV. It's just a little toy, and it's really hard to tell where the miniature stops and the live action begins.
it was not without its challenges. And going downtown, uh, it was very challenging because we had to lay people in the streets. There had to be dead bodies everywhere. So we had all these people and we had to close off the streets and we had to lay people out in the road. And just, you know, it's something to try to make a big shot, to make a big shot that shows buildings with the tops missing and things crumbling. And we used miniature buildings that we had created with the walls broken apart and we set all this sort of stuff up. I believe if something like this ever did happen, uh, it really would be the end of the world. I think that America is not only ready to accept gay-themed stories, I think that they are ready to celebrate those. The films that we're making for here, they're really just good programs in which characters and lead positions happen to be gay, like the real world. It's part of life, it's slice of life, and that's really what television is supposed to do, is hold up a mirror. My grandparents were Ozzie and Harriet Nelson, and I thought there needs to be a, a, a gay sitcom with two guys, normal American family with two dads, and it should be called The Adventures of Ozzie and Harry. And I think that would be a, I think my grandfather might, might be all right with that. It's a movie about you know, earthquakes and disasters. Oh, and the main characters are gay. And I think that that's um, really a wonderful thing because it's, it's just one's sexuality and the color of one's skin or whatever it might be is just who you are. It defines you in, in certainly in a way, but what you do in the world is something completely different. I enjoy working with the HERE Network because they're willing to take a chance. Everything is not so cut and dried. I think it's a very exciting place because it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a network, but it's a combination of several networks. It's, it's PBS, it's the Learning Channel, it's also Cinemax. It has a little bit of everything, and they're not afraid to take a chance. The shows, are, are I think, are very diverse, and the whole idea that we would make movies like this uh, are, are pretty exciting because it's daring. It's daring, you're taking, you're taking a chance, and I think that just shows bold leadership. I think Here Films is great. We know that we're part of a community of like-minded individuals, that we're striving for equality, that we're trying to make a difference, we're trying to shake things up and shatter the stereotypical images in the world. I mean, it sounds so corny, but I think we can change the world with places like Here. I think Polar Opposites will strike a certain chord with audiences because it's about people. It's about people that you can identify with. I always love a story about ordinary people in an extraordinary situation. And I think it's exciting. And I mean, the fact that you can actually have this disaster happen and still have somewhat of a happy ending and everybody gets together, I think is a wonderful thing.